So uh, this morning, we'll get started with our keynote speaker. I'm delighted to introduce my uh, colleague and partner, Dr. Doug Wallace, who is director of the Center for Mitochondrial and Epigenomic Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He holds the Michael and Charles Barnett Endowed Chair in Pediatric Mitochondrial Medicine and Metabolic Diseases. More than 35 years ago, Dr. Wallace and his colleagues founded the field of human mitochondrial genetics. Dr. Wallace showed that the mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from the mother and that genetic alterations in the mitochondrial DNA can result in a wide range of metabolic and neurodegenerative diseases. And there's really nobody better to start off Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Week than Dr. Wallace. Please, Dr. Wallace. Thank you very much, Marnie. Um, it's an honor to welcome you all to our program. Uh, I've uh, been privileged to work with this group for now over 10 years, our leader, Marnie Falk, and uh, we're represented here by the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program and uh, the Center for Mitochondrial and Epigenomic Medicine, which Marnie and I co wrecked um, Our goal today um, in this first session is to give you a historical perspective about uh, how the whole field of mitochondrial genetics, biology, and medicine evolved uh, and set the stage for what we hope will soon be some effective therapies. So um, the mitochondria was first observed in the late 1890s by Richard Altman, <clears throat> and uh, then it was called a mitochondrion by Carl Brenda. Um, when Altman looked at cells with the relatively new microscope, he saw structures such as these in this much more beautiful picture, um, and he thought they were bacteria. <clears throat> and when you look at a very high voltage electron micrograph of the edge of such a cell, you see that lo and behold, he was right. Inside each of your cells are hundreds to thousands of little bacteria. Now, how did that bacteria get in there? Well, they got in there about uh, two and a half billion years ago when you were only a single cell. Uh, that was before you were an egg. Uh, but the original single cell had a amalgamation of two different life forms, an archaeobacteria, which gave rise ultimately to the nuclear cytosol, and a U bacteria that gave rise to our beloved mitochondria. Now, since both of them were separate uh, organisms, they have their own DNA. The DNA is transcribed into RNAs. The RNA is translated into proteins, and the proteins then have function. Now, the nuclear cytosol codes for all the important structures to make a complex multicellular organism but the mitochondrial DNA codes for the most important proteins that are involved in making energy. So literally, the mitochondria is the power plant of the cell. Uh, it's the uh, mitochondrial DNA codes for a set of transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and 13 proteins, and those 13 proteins are all key, key wiring components of the power plant of oxidative phosphorylation. So it codes for seven of the 45 proteins of complex one, one of the 11 proteins of complex three, three of the 13 proteins of complex four, and two of the uh, 17 proteins of complex five. And as you'll see in a minute, these enzymes are the structures that generate the energy that you do use for all of the functions in your life. Now, these mitochondrial ribosomes are originally derived from a bacterial ribosome, so they're sensitive to inhibitors characteristic of bacterial ribosomes, such as chloramphenicol. And if you take chloramphenicol too long, you in fact will poison your mitochondria, and that will in fact diminish your energy. So what we're gonna do is talk about how all of these concepts came to be. And originally, as we heard in the late uh, 19th century, um, mitochondria were discovered. And that led then people to understand what they did, what their function was. And their function is to make energy by oxidative phosphorylation. That then led um, uh, um, pioneers to realize that defects in oxidative phosphorylation might in fact result in energy diseases. Currently, there were individuals that discovered that there was DNA inside the mitochondria, and that led to mitochondrial DNA genetics. And then in 1988, uh, these two ideas came together with the discovery that mutations in the mitochondrial DNA could cause disease. This then led to a plethora of exciting new discoveries and uh, realization of a whole new class of diseases. So from the mitochondrial point of view, uh, there are mitochondrial DNA inherited diseases, and there are 
mutations that accumulate in mitochondrial DNA, those can give rise to spontaneous diseases, but they're also very ancient polymorphisms, and these polymorphisms predispose to common diseases. So these systems then result in one class of mitochondrial diseases. But there are also about one to 2,000 nuclear encoded genes that are involved in making mitochondrial energy, and they then can also mutate and give rise to disease. So therapeutically then, um, our colleagues have developed animal models for mitochondrial disease, use those to develop metabolic therapy, but even more excitingly, more recently, there have been somatic gene therapy approaches for nuclear genetic mitochondrial diseases and germline uh, gene therapy for inherited mitochondrial DNA diseases, the so-called three-parent babies. So I'd like to introduce you to the people that made all of these fantastic advances possible. So let's go back to uh, what the mitochondria does. Well, the mitochondria makes energy in the form of ATP. But before that was really understood, um, people were interested in how chemicals are modified inside the body. And one of the real leaders in the early 20th century was uh, Hans Krebs. And Hans Krebs, along with uh, other people in the field at that time, realized that inside the mitochondria, there is a, a circular pathway, which we call the Krebs cycle, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And its purpose is to strip hydrogens off the carbons, the hydrocarbons in your diet. And they put them on a carrier called NAD, and you now have the hydrogen NADH. So that hydrogen is then burned by the mitochondrial electron transport chain, and that is converted, that energy is converted to ATP, which is then exchanged out to provide energy to work. And that can, there's an alternative approach, which is using a chemical succinate that can go through succinate and then through complex three and four to generate energy as well. So once this idea was developed, then many investigators, including our own Britain Chance here at Penn and Al Leninger and Yos Hatefi and John Walker and uh, Paul Boyer and others, all worked hard to figure out how these hydrogens were converted into ATP. And they studied these respiratory complexes, complex one, three, four, and five. So this is now, as of uh, last year, what we now know about these amazing complexes. So this is complex one. It takes NADH and reduces it, oxidizes it to NAD. And then the electrons flow through complex one. They go to coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q carries electrons to complex three. Complex three then feeds electrons to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C feeds electrons to cytochrome C oxidase. And as the electrons flow down this electron transport chain, the energy is used to pump positive charges from the inside of the mitochondria uh, out to give you an electrochemical gradient that is acid and positive on the outside and alkaline and negative on the inside. And this led uh, Peter um, Mitchell to realize that that was the potential energy for all of life. So that potential energy can then be used by this enzyme, the ATP synthase, which is really a spinning wheel, the axle of which turns inside this barrel, and it condenses ADP and phosphate, and the ATP is then exchanged out into the mitochondria where it fuels doing work. So this was then uh, the fundamental understanding of how we make energy. At the same time, there was a cell biology study on how this process all occurs. And inside the mitochondria are these structures, and these structures are known as Christi. And if you look at um, a mu um, skeletal muscle or a heart cell, you'll find that these uh, Christi then are aligned across uh, mitochondria. So the mitochondria actually communicate with each other through these Christi. So what are the Christi actually doing? Well, it turns out that those oxidative phosphorylation enzymes that I just talked about here, these enzymes, are all arrayed along these Christi membranes. So here is a Christi that's enfolded. It's closed by an, a protein called OPA1. And these enzymes then pump the protons from the mitochondrial matrix into this Christi space. So this is the matrix. This is the Christi, and inside is the Christi space. So that then concentrates the protons, and then the ATP synthases are located at the ends of the Christi, as shown here, and there they have the maximum potential energy to generate ATP. 
or if we draw a diagram of that, let's say these two mitochondria juxtaposed to each other, here are their Christi with the protein proton gradients, here are the ATP synthases, and the electron transport chain is pumping the protons in, and then the protons go out to make ATP. So now we have a very uh, nice description of the biophysics of how we actually make energy. So the difference between being alive and dead is whether you have this membrane potential, this high level of uh, electric chemical potential <coughs> inside the Christie, and when you stop breathing, that electrochemical potential collapses, and then you become inert, and uh, then you can join the anatom anatomy department as a cadaver. Okay, so moving on. Once um, the idea that mitochondria generates energy through oxidative phosphorylation became uh, an understanding, then people began to look for diseases, patients that might have this defect. <clears throat> and the leader of this group was a man named um, Rolf Luft, and Rolf Luft was at the Carroll Institute. And they discovered this very interesting young woman who generated tremendous amounts of heat. So when you burn um, hydrogen, you not only can use that energy to make potential energy, but it also releases a lot of heat. And it turned out that that woman was burning her calories at an enormous rate. And when they looked at her mitochondria, they were highly abnormal. And so this uncoupled mitochondria, which was very inefficient and was simply burning the energy to make heat instead of ATP, that was the first patient with a known mitochondrial disease. Subsequently, um, uh, Salvador de Morai, who was originally at the University of Pennsylvania, followed up on another patient with this um, hypermetabolism phenotype, and then went on to join Columbia Physicians and Surgeons, where he was very in, uh, instrumental in defining many other mitochondrial diseases, such as MELAS, MRF, and involved in uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. But as at the same time, John Morgan Hughes at Queen's uh, Square Institute in London was working on muscle diseases. And so these three people really defined the physiology and the phenotype of mitochondrial disease. And currently, there were people that were molecular biologists. And this is a picture of what's called the uh, RNA tie club of 1955. And this is Jim Watson. That's Francis Crick. That's Leslie Orgel. They, of course, won the Nobel Prize for the structure of DNA. But who we care about is this gentleman. His name is Alex Rich. And Alex Rich was the first to discover that organelles have DNA in 1963. Uh, then um, with that discovery, people started studying um, baker's yeast. And Godfrey Schatz and Georgi Bernardi, uh, these two individuals, began to characterize the mitochondrial DNA of Baker's yeast and show that it could have genetic traits. And Margaret Nass, about the same time that Alex Rich was describing organelle DNA, she observed inside mitochondria these thread-like structures, which when she put in DNA disappeared. And later, several years later, she was able to actually isolate the mitochondrial DNA in an electron micrograph and show that it was a circular molecule. So this was the discovery of the mitochondrial DNA of animals. Now the yeast people then were studying very, working very hard to understand um, mitochondrial genetics. And the first person who really made an important contribution was Boris Hufrusi, and he discovered yeast cells that were very, very small, which he, being French, called petite yeast cells. These were later shown to have deletions in the mitochondrial DNA by Godfrey Schatz and uh, Georgi Bernardi. And that then led to a detailed study of the genetics of the mitochondria by leaders such as Piotrix Lenemski of France and Tony Lenane of Australia. So by 1998, we had the complete sequence of the yeast mitochondrial DNA. And now we can see ATPA 6, 8, and 9, which is not found in the animal mitochondria DNA, cytochrome oxidase, uh, cytochrome, uh, I mean, cytochrome B, cytochrome oxidase subunits, and all the ATP, uh, all the tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. Concurrently, our group was interested in whether the animal mitochondrial DNA could have genetic traits, so we isolated cells that were resistant to chloramphenicol. Remember, that inhibits the mitochondrial ribosome. And so the question we had was whether that 
uh, chloramphenicol resistance was coated in the nucleus or the mitochondria. So the plan we had was to take those chloramphenicol resistant cells, remove their nuclei by a method that had been developed with cytoclasin B and centrifugation, and then take the cytoplasmic fragment with their mitochondria and now fuse it to a cell that was chloramphenicol sensitive and select for this nucleus, but for the chloramphenicol resistance. And if it was in fact coded outside the nucleus, then this transmission would give you then chloramphenicol resistant cells with these nuclei. And in fact, that was true. And that showed then that the animal mitochondrial DNA also coded for genetic traits. With this system, we were able then to demonstrate that inside the animal cell, there are hundreds to thousands of mitochondrial DNAs, and you could get mixtures of mutant and normal, which we called heteroplasmy. We also showed that when the cell divides down the middle, then both daughter cells would get some mutant and some normal. But when the cell divided this way, then this cell would only get normal, and this would get twice as many mutant. And we call that replicative segregation. And what that led to was cells with different percentages of mutant mitochondrial DNAs. Now, since the mutant mitochondrial DNA codes for the wiring diagram of the power plant, the more mutant mitochondrial DNAs you have, the less energy. And when the energy of that tissue falls below the minimum necessary for this function of the cells, then you get a, uh, ener the equivalent of a mitochondrial um, metropolitan brownout, and that then begins to give you clinical phenotypes, and we called that the bioenergetic threshold. So this then gave the pr parameters on which we could begin to look for mitochondrial disease. Concurrently, um, then uh, uh, the um, Fred Sanger's laboratory had developed a way of sequencing the mitochondrial DNA, and this is in the light, late um, uh, 1970s. And in 1980, then, Anderson and his colleagues um, published the first mitochondrial DNA sequence of a human. And these are the genes that were found. At that time, only the genes that were known were the cytochrome oxidase genes, um, the cytochrome B gene down here, and uh, some of the ATP synthase genes. Later, though, uh, we and others, including the TARDI lab, began to assign these unidentified reading frames, and ultimately most of them turned out to be respiratory complex one genes. This is uh, Giuseppe Attardi, who was a pioneer in the molecular biology of human mitochondrial DNA, and this is the transcription map that he developed, well, along with his colleagues, Russ Doolittle, and Komen, uh, Giulio uh, Montoya, and um, Denise uh, Gial Jala. Um, and what you can see now is all of the complex one genes are shown in the map. Here is ND1, ND2, um, 3, 4, L4, 5, and 6, and then uh, cytochrome B, CO1, 2, and 3, and ATPA 6 and 8 down here uh, in this region, plus all the transfer RNAs and the ribosomal RNAs that punctuate the genes. So we were interested then to do human genetics, so we wanted to know how this was inherited. So we developed uh, the first uh, mitochondrial DNA molecular radioactive probes, and the method for doing restriction enzyme digest for look at variants in the mitochondrial DNA had just been reported, and a method put for putting DNA fragments onto filters was reported by Southern. So we took those uh, methods using restriction enzyme and um, cell lines from uh, human families, and we digested with the enzyme, put it on the paper, hybridized with the um, a radioactive mitochondrial probe, and what you can see is that we found that the mother and all of her children had the same pattern, which was different from the father, and that's shown again here and many other times. So that showed then that the mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, and this was our original blot, actually. So after that, then, we then did a more, use the same method to digest mitochondrial DNA from my populations around the world. And what amazed us is that every continent had different mitochondrial DNA patterns, implying that, in fact, the maternally inherited mitochondrial DNA was accumulating mutations as people migrated out of Africa and around the world um, to populate the different continents. Concurrently, we were looking for mutations that were maternally inherited. This is a pedigree where the blindness is transmitted through the maternal line, and that's now known as Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, and we proved that that was due to a mutation in the ND4 gene at 11778, changing an arginine code on 340 to a histidine. 
Um, concurrently, we had this pedigree, which had both muscle and neurological symptoms, now known as the Milos syndrome, I mean the MRF syndrome, my mistake, and the MRF syndrome then also showed maternal inheritance, and when we used the southern blot technique, we could see that this is the wild type and these are the mutant mitochondrial DNAs, that all of these people were heteroplasmic, and they were segregating the mutant mitochondrial DNA, and that was relating to their phenotype. And this was a mutation in the tRNA uh, lysine gene, an ADG. So over the uh, intervening time, my colleagues Marie Lott and um, Vincent Procasio have been accumulating all of the mitochondrial DNA mutations that people uh, have found, and there are now uh, hundreds of them, and MitoMap, which were, is our reference for this, is, is um, accessed from around the world. Concurrently, uh, people became interested in spontaneous mutations, and Holt Harding and Morgan Hughes, also in 1988, uh, reported a paper in Nature on deletions of the mitochondrial DNA, and this is just two examples of their deletions. Um, this is Ian Holt, this is Anita Harding, and then John Morgan Hughes, and regrettably, uh, Anita died very young. John uh, died recently, but Ian is still uh, hard at work. What we showed was that these deletions often occurred around regions of direct uh, or inverted repeats, and that those then seemed to be important in the deletion process. And the other interesting thing that we found was that when you looked at muscle of one of these CEOP patients, you would see the wild type mitochondrial DNA and the deleted, but when you looked at their blood, you did not see the deletion. So this deletion was lost in the blood, even though it was found in post-mitotic tissues. And that's now important in understanding CPEO and other related diseases. Concurrently, people are beginning to look at nuclear gene mutations. This is one of the early mutations uh, that uh, affects complex one gene and UFS8, and each parent had one mutant copy and one normal copy of the gene, but unfortunately this child got both mutant copies and then had the disease Lee syndrome. At the same time, Zev uh, um, Massimo Zeviani, uh, together with um, in, in um, Salivar DeMaro's laboratory, found this pedigree, where these people were related through the patrilineal and matrilineal lineage, but still had deletions. And it turned out that this was the first nuclear encoded gene in mitochondrial DNA replication and repair that gives rise to multiple deletions and also the same CPEO disease. And then uh, Anu uh, Subramanian uh, published a paper on the adenine nucleotide translocator, the actual protein that exchanges ATP and ADP across the mitochondrial inner membrane, and that also resulted in multiple deletion syndrome. So again, nuclear mutations destabilize the mitochondrial DNA and result in then a mitochondrial disease. So to prove that these diseases were in fact due to mitochondrial mutations, we made a mouse in which we inactivated the adenine nucleotide translocator, and this exchanges ATP and ADP, and it's the heart muscle isoform. And you can see that if we look at the mitochondria, we have abnormal mitochondria that are proliferating, high levels of uh, damaged mitochondria, and we get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to wild type. We then went on to make mice that had mitochondrial DNA point mutations. So this is a mutation in the ND6 proline 25 to leucine. This is the same mutation that gives rise to Lee syndrome in humans. And when we looked at the optic nerve of those um, mice, we found that the optic nerves were swollen and that with abnormal mitochondria and resulted in multi-system disease. We also made a cytochrome oxidase mutation, and this animal had cardiomyopathy with fibrosis and abnormal mitochondria. And now it's pretty clear that a single point mutation is more than enough to give you multi-system disease. Concurrently, Niels um, Larsen and then uh, later another group uh, made a mutation in the nuclear encoded DNA polymerase. And this DNA polymerase, which is replicates the mitochondrial DNA, this is a, a mutation that knocks out the proofreading system. And when they did that, they saw a large increase in these age-related accumulation of mitochondrial DNA mutations, and that animal developed premature aging. And now there are two such animals, uh, one from Wisconsin and one from Germany that have this phenotype. So then, Concurrently, we were interested in using the maternal inheritance to look at how mitochondrial mutations accumulate as people migrated around the world, and could we use that to reconstruct human migration? Because uh, if you sequence two mitochondrial DNAs, 
from two different individuals, the number of differences is proportional to the time they shared a common mother. So by finding aboriginal populations from around the world, we were able to show that the mitochondrial DNAs originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago. These are the Khoisan of the Kalahari. Then there were two different pygmy lineages, L1 and L2, then a sub-Saharan African lineage, L3, and from that gave rise to two different mitochondrial DNAs, LM that stayed in the tropics all the way down to Australia and then later moved into the temperate zone in Asia, and M that moved directly into the temperate zone that gave rise to a whole series of lineages that then formed um, a uh, temperate zone population across Eurasia. And then ultimately only um, four mitochondrial DNAs left uh, Siberia, crossed the Bering Land Bridge, and colonized the Americas. And why that was important to mitochondrial DNA disease, as it turned out that Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy has a very variable expression. Some uh, men, go blind, others do not, and women are less prone to go blind. And what we found then was that the penetrance of this mutation was directly related to these mitochondrial DNA lineages. So a very severe mutation, it didn't matter what the mitochondrial DNA lineage was, in this case, lineage J, which is 10% of the population. But this milder mutation, more of the individuals had this uh, mutation J, our variant J, and even milder mutations, almost all were J. And those that didn't have that had some other amplifying mutation. So now we have different background mitochondrial DNA variations interacting with the new pathogenic mutation. So these haplogroups, as we call them, because these are the mitochondrial lineages, these then could be correlated with common diseases. And this just shows our study where we've correlated the odds ratio, which is the risk factor, of the mitochondrial European lineages for autism. And this then is um, 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 the human variation. And you can see that these lineages, I, J, K, T, U, have a odds ratio about two. The, there's a strong male predilection to um, autism, and that's about fourfold more males than females. So these mitochondrial lineages are half as strong as um, as gender, and they represent 55% of the European population, so this has a big risk of autism. If we then look at the mitochondrial mouse that has the neurological mutation, it also has many of the same features of autism. It has reduced social activity, hypersensitivity uh, to stress uh, and fear conditioning, and alterations in neuronal electro, uh, uh, electronic function. So then the accumulation of somatic mutations along with inherited mutations would seem to then set a situation where you could have different times where you would cross these expression thresholds. Let's say that we have very good mitochondrial DNAs to begin with and we accumulate somatic mutations, then we would not have a clinical symptom crossing expression threshold in the brain or the heart or the liver uh, or the kidney until very late in life. But if we start with a partial mitochondrial defect, then as the somatic mutations accumulate, we cross those expression thresholds earlier, and that would then give you premature disease. <clears throat> so since we think those, oxygen, those um, mutations are due to the accumulation of mitochondrially generated oxygen radicals, we took a enzyme catalase that removes oxygen radicals, we targeted it to the mitochondria, and we put it into then a mouse, and we reduced the mitochondrial mutation rate by about 30%, and we extended their lifespan by about 20%. So that shows then that mitochondrial DNA mutations are both the aging clock and cause the delayed onset and progressive course of disease. So with the biochemical studies then, people began to look at therapeutics, and these are coenzyme Q analogs, which is the carrier of carrying electrons from complex one to complex three. And these are some of the ones that have been developed that would try to enhance that process. Or mitochondria has a self-destruct system, so some of the anti-self-destruct uh, system drugs to keep the cells alive. But one of the things that we found that was most interesting is if you looked at um, the reason for why males are more sensitive than females, you would immediately begin to think of the estrogen and estrogen receptor. And what we discovered is that about 20% of the estrogen receptor is in the mitochondrial matrix. So that implies that when, in fact, estradiol binds to this enzyme, what we found is it more than doubled the antioxidant defenses of the mitochondria within 60 minutes 
So this implies then that the reason women are more resistant to neurological mitochondrial disease is that they have a built-in system to uh, enhance mitochondrial antioxidant defenses. And so Val Valerio Corelli used our data to choose two um, uh, tr traditional Chinese um, herbal medicines, and these are uh, phytoestrogens that bind to estrogen receptor beta, but not estrogen receptor alpha, and therefore are non-feminizing. And when he looked at the um, common Labors mutation, 11778, and he gave this combination of activators of estrogen receptor beta, he normalized the mitochondrial function of uh, these uh, cell lines. So this is a very exciting potential for metabolic therapy for one of the diseases. And currently, people were interested in gene therapy, and one approach was to make a uh, take the mitochondrial gene, uh, turn it into a gene that has the same genetic code as the nucleus, put the protein, a, a mitochondrial targeting peptide, have it transcribed in the nucleus, translated into a protein in the cytoplasm, have the protein imported into the mitochondria, where it then would complement the defect. And this is called allotopic complementation. And it is currently being used in clinical trials for the Labors 11778 mutation by John Guy, Maricel Corel Dobrinsky, and in China, Ben Li. At the same time, people were interested in germline uh, mutations, and both uh, the group in, uh, in Britain and uh, Newcastle and group in Oregon developed approach, approach where they took oocytes with a mutant mitochondria. They removed the nucleus, in this case, the spindle. They then took a normal oocyte from a normal woman, removed its spindle, fused in this spindle into this oocyte, and diluted out the mutant mitochondrial DNAs. So now we have 90% healthy mitochondrial DNAs and only 1% mutant, as opposed to 100% mutant before. And this method has already been used to create uh, living individuals, uh, one individual with Lee syndrome who uh, his mother's mother gave rise to children with Lee syndrome, but the child with this three-parent baby uh, now appears to be relatively normal. So finally then, if we then begin to think as bioenergetics as the center of medicine rather than anatomy as is currently organized, then we can begin to see that all the common diseases have a mitochondrial bioenergetic basis. You can have mutations in the nuclear genes or their changes in their expression. You can have alteration in uh, the ancient polymorphisms or changes in recent mutations. Or you can change your diet or you can smoke and poison your mitochondria. All of these things will inhibit mitochondrial function. That will damage the mitochondrial DNA. You'll get a progressive age-related decline, and that's aging and causes delayed onset and progressive disease. And it will affect the most energetic organs, the brain, the heart, the muscle, and the renal, all the ones with a common disease. And it will cause a buildup of substrates, which are carbohydrates and fats, and that's metabolic syndrome. And finally, if the mitochondria actually are released in the bloodstream, they act as bacterial antigens, and they activate in the inflammasome. And that's why all of these common diseases have inflammation, and why cancer is all about energy and inflammation. Thank you very much.